Welcome to Surfacing. In this episode, hosts Lisa Welchman and Andy Vitali are joined by leadership coach Margaret Lee. Margaret spoke about her experience as director of UX community and culture at Google and offered good advice for starting a community of practice. Finally, Margaret discussed the personal impact of her article and talk, Insight from a Reluctant Leader. Andy, are you going to kick off this time? I am. And, and Margaret, it's it's so, I feel like we met at Flexible like 2019-ish. So it's it's been a while, but I, I've been really, well, we'll talk about all the things that you have going on for sure. We met throughout. when the world was different. I know. It's uh, such a different place now, but hopefully we'll be back to normal. Anyway, so so Margaret, thanks for joining us today. Um, You've been a leader at some really interesting places, you know, Yahoo, TiVo, Google. I'd love to just have you tell us a little bit about who you are and and your journey to get there. Sure. Um, Well, I'm Margaret Lee, and I most recently was at Google. I left a month ago to basically pursue leadership coaching, and I'm doing that through a training and certification process at the Hudson Institute in Santa Barbara. Um, So kind of working backwards, I've I've been at Google for about 14 and a half years. Oh, I was at Google for 14 and a half years. I have to get used to the past tense now. And uh, I spent the majority of my time, like the first nine years, really mostly working in Google Maps and helping to build that team and the product and really seeing the evolution of, of not just Google Maps, but the industry and the UX function and technology over that period of time was really fascinating. And then the last five years, I spent leading a program that I actually founded called UX Community and Culture. And that was a program that was really focused on um, basically empowering the UX function at Google, which got so big over time. I think when I left, it was about 5,000 globally, which is insane. Wow. Yeah. So that was a really fantastic role. Um, So before that, I was briefly at TiVo and... uh, I didn't, I didn't spend too much time there because I think what I realized was I was looking for a place that um, maybe maybe was a little bit more forward moving in terms of the technology. I think TiVo at the time was pretty much settled on the product that they had. So great product. I love the product, but it wasn't uh, necessarily what, what I was looking for. So I didn't stay there very long. And before that, I was at Yahoo. And I had done Yahoo Personals, which was really <laughs> fascinating. Days I remember Tinder, that. I remember that. I remember that. So super interesting um, thing there. And also what was called, I think it was called uh, the media group. So it was basically all the content stuff, you know, like finance and sports and news and entertainment, all those products before they moved that whole division down um, to, to Santa Monica. So I was there for a while. And then before that, lots of other internet uh, concerns that no longer exist before the dot bomb era, but been around the, the tech industry for quite a long time. Just going right to your time as the director for Google Maps, you know, one of the things that you've mentioned is the constant change in rapid scale. I'd really like to know some of the things you learned about change management from that experience, but also looking back on that was the constant change in rapid scale actually necessary? Did it lead to better outcomes? And, and what trade-offs went along with that? Well, there's so many different dimensions to constant change in scale. And some of it is absolutely necessary because, you know, it's it's the industry and it's the world that's changing around us. And so you either adapt or, or, or you don't, right? And, um, you know, I, I, think, I think that's what was so exciting for me to come to Google and, and, you know, to be in a place where the industry is just changing. I mean, at that point, we weren't even doing mobile yet. Like this first smartphone, the iPhone hadn't even come out when I 
join Google Maps, right? So it was, everything was desktop. It was third, you know, it was behind MapQuest and Yahoo. So there was just so much runway you can imagine. So to get from there to kind of where Google Maps is today with with navigation, which we used to use those those things that you'd buy at Costco and stick in your car for navigation, right? It wasn't like just with you all the time. You can imagine the amount of change that was happening to get from, from where it was to, to where it is today. Um, so a lot of it is necessary because you, you just have to keep pace. Um, and then a lot of it is just, it's also opportunity. Like, you know, I use the example of Street View. We were just starting to do Street View in 2007 you know, the first miles had been driven around Palo Alto, you know, around Stanford, where Larry Page originated the Street View concept in his uh, graduate school days or whatever. And nobody really knew what it was going to be for, right? So um, it was a technology without much of a use case when it started. But over time, because again, the, the world is changing around us and technology is making all, all these things possible, you can see street view is just integrated into things like travel planning or buying a house or you know uh, a number of a number of use cases that we didn't imagine when the technology first existed so to me change can be a, a really wonderful way to make possibilities happen right but um, I guess the downside is like when you're yeah are, are, are we sometimes churning rather than changing for a positive? I don't think that that was usually the case, but it can feel like that when you're in the thick of it. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because some people like I gravitate towards change all the time and it sounds like you do too, but there are people on the team that, that are kind of like, Oh, another change. They get yeah. that change fatigue. So, you know, what experiences have you had or some of the things that you've learned about managing others to get excited about the next change that's coming? Um, you know, I think change is inevitable. <laughs> like it just really is. And I think that the change that is hard on organizations is actually organizational change. Like reorgs are harder than when you think about um, product changes, I think. But often reorgs happen in order to make some kind of product shift possible that that is theoretically you know the reasons why we do reorgs is to better align to product outcomes that we want to see happen and as you know you also mentioned scale it, it gets really hard as the company gets bigger to figure out how to organize yourself to product outcomes that that basically yield a, a coherent user experience that isn't you know, you're not showing your organization in your in your navigation menu, for example, which is kind of it happens, right? Like you can sort of tell sometimes when like different features are built by separate teams because they don't actually interact well together. I think that that reorgs are a result of trying to figure that out of like how do we how do we get the teams to you know the right teams to collaborate across you know. Uh, business units or feature teams or whatever the, the scale of, of team is. And, and I think from my observation, that's where change has been difficult is, is having to learn how to work across these, these boundaries. Yeah. I mean, that, that really um, resonates with me. The work I do in digital governance is all about designing team structures and collaboration models and getting people to work more effectively around digital spaces. And one of the things that I consistently recommend and why I'm so excited to be talking to you, um, when someone comes to me and says, yeah, we understand that we need to take a more mature approach towards digital governance, but we really can't get management to pay attention to it, um, either because we're already making a lot of money and nobody wants to rock the boat or whatever, or power of politics, whatever the case may be. One of the things that I consistently say people can do is build an internal community of practice. Yes. Right. So that you can start communicating with each other and sharing information back and forth, you know, outside of more formalized policies and standards and work consistent, you know, design la libraries, pattern libraries, those sorts of things. So I was super excited when Andy said, let's get Margaret to come on. I was like, yes, community is a practice. So um, just stepping that in that direction for a minute, um, I, I can put you on the spot because I know you know this stuff so well. Um, 
what's the value of a community of practice for folks? What, what, how about this? Why don't you define it for us, your definition of a community of practice, and, and what value do you think it can bring in an organization that's struggling with those silos, that's struggling to, to work across you know, multiple geographies, multiple product lines, or some combination of that, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, you actually encapsulated it really well, what you, how you described the problem statement. Because it isn't just about the formalized practices. I mean, yes, you can have design systems and yes, you can have kind of like, you know, here's here's the blessed way that we do things or whatever, right? Right. Um, but human beings are highly variable, you know, components in the system. And when you're, and it really isn't just a big company problem. I think this happens as soon as you have more than one team, you have yep. this issue of like potential siloing and you know, turf and all that. Um, so the community of practice or, you know, what we call the UX community culture program um, was really geared towards that, that part that nobody owns. You know, it's all the stuff that tends to fall between the cracks of organizational accountability um, because there's so many issues and problems that are actually shared, but aren't owned necessarily by any one group or they're kind of owned by one group, but, Really, the stakeholders live in another group. And so that was really the that was the opportunity that I saw with with the whole UXCC program was just like somebody needs to be looking after this as, as like a job. Like it should yeah. be somebody's accountability <laughs> yeah. and not always like a 20 percent thing, because that's basically, you know, what was was my premise for proposing this was like, look, I've been doing this for nine years on the side. As I was yeah, trying off to the you side know, of your desk, yeah, exactly. Yeah, as I was trying to kind of like build the the Google Maps UX team, right? In order to do that, we I knew that there were, and it wasn't just me, by the way. It was many other leaders doing this under twenty percent time too. Um, but doing things like, oh well, you know, we actually need different kinds of roles that don't exist yet because you know they're still mired in you know the early aughts of Google's yeah. uh, you know early days. Um, so needing to define new job ladders. So things like change management at the company level, I think was really important for UX to have a, a stake in because that's where, you know, that's part of the system that enables us to function you know, as a healthy organization, right? So there's a lot of things like that, the, the processes of what our job ladders are, how do you get, you know, what's the hiring process, the promo process, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's all the unofficial stuff that's just about human beings coming together. And as you observed, like, you know, if, if you can't communicate well, then how are you expected to collaborate well, right? So if you don't even know who the other person is, you're less likely to be, to be, reach out, you know, when the time comes. Because at least at Google, there's so many business units that have to work together, right? So ads is obviously a really big business unit um, at Google, but prop most of the products are also monetized, so they have to work with the ads team. Yeah, so that's just yeah. like one obvious example, but there were many other ones. Like when I was working on Google Maps, local search was a, a big crossover with the search team. And so, you know, just year over year, I would see the same sort of issues tend to crop up in terms of, you know, whatever the the cadence of things that would mark your activity, right? Like roadmap planning. Okay, well, we're going to have to make sure that our objectives align to the search and the ads objectives, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just not on the UX side. That's across all functions, right? So it becomes this really complex matrix of interactions that have to happen that there's no real defined process for because it's, again, it's so relationship driven a lot of times. And you can have a certain amount of top-down mandate of like, okay, you have to go work with that team. But really, it's like on the ground. Yeah. How to make that happen when you don't have defined ways of doing things is, is very dependent on relationships. And, no, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny what you're saying because it's it's um, one of the things that I hear a lot when I kick off projects with folks is uh, 
a lot, a little less now than it used to be, is that, you know, we'll, we'll get everybody in a room together and I, and I want to do a terminology tech. I want to introduce myself and tell people, here's the language we're using, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll say, you know, this is the first time we've all been in a room together. And you're like, what? You've got a 97-year-old website <laughs> and, you've never, <laughs> and you've never actually ever, you know, gotten in the same room speaking to each other. So it's, it's really interesting to, to hear you talk about that. And one of my theories, and I just want to bounce it off of you because um, uh, I feel like we have a lot of things in common. It's really interesting to talk to you and, and hear you talk. Um, I, I believe that that the team model, the model of people, I, I don't want to say factory because I want to get away from that linear manufacturing model that we often use to describe the way people work, which I think is not helpful or healthy. But I believe that the collaboration model that is required to produce a product or a service or a thing at all in, in a lot of ways deeply reflects the nature of that thing. Mm -hmm. And because the web is so complex and interrelated, intertwingled, as Peter Morville would mm -hmm. say, interactive, and has all of these sort of cross silo relationships, not only within a product that you may be creating yourself, but also with general website standards, W3C standards, and or industry standards if you're working in finance or all of these other sorts of things, that, that means that the collaboration model is going to be sort of convoluted mm -hmm. and weird. And so I think those, um, because it's going to reflect that product, and I think that communities of practice where people are at least looking at each other and saying, yeah, we're working on this thing together. And yes, I deeply believe in governing frameworks I'll, I'll put because it's required. And I think a lack of firm and solid governing frameworks is contributing to some of the challenges that we see online right now. I also think that's just a maturity issue, right? And that that, that will shift over, over time. But I also just feel like there'll always be a role for people just getting together in a room and talking to each other. And a lot of these problems can either be, you know, kept from happening in the first place and that there can be a good feeling amongst the people who are creating something together. And that good feeling is only going to make things better, which might sound a little soft. And so I'm wondering, you know, what you think about those sort of that human factor of feeling good at work and how that contributes to the quality of what people are making and how that might contribute to the user experience, um, improved user experience. Do you think that's a factor? And do you think communities of practice play a part in that? Or is that just something I've made up in my head mm -hmm. <laughs> and hope is true? Oh, I, <laughs> I think it's a huge factor. And, and, and in fact, I mean, that it's kind of at the premise of, you know, the whole program of UX community and culture at Google was, um, you know, ha having some shared sense of purpose, right? Or sh shared sense of something rather than all being siloed senses of whatever each team was doing was very, uh, it, it underlaid everything that I, I felt was important for UXCC as a program because especially as Google scaled. And like I said, it's not just a scale issue, but it is, you know, multiplied a thousand fold when, when you're the size of Google and you have such sprawl in terms of where everybody's geographically located. And even like in Mountain View, where the, the headquarters are, you would find people, um, you know, video conferencing from one floor to the other because there was just no time to go, you know, to travel to meet in person, which was just crazy, right? So you would just see this, this tendency for us to kind of stay in our own lanes, which is just not healthy when you're trying to, you know, create coherent user experiences where, you know, our customers aren't uh, feeling the division within the product, right? They should just kind of, it should just be natural. Um, but the other thing is there's so, there's so much knowledge at, at Google. So like, there's so much expertise, you know, you're talking 5,000 people, right? Like there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise. And you know that, you know that there are some people that have knowledge that more people should know about. So there was a, a big effort to how do we unlock the knowledge that people hold and make it available for people who need it? Because there's, there's a lot of expertise that, that is really valuable, right? Um, and so a lot of the programs that, that we did were geared towards that. And so a lot of the community events, for example, UXU, UX University was probably what our team was best known for. And um, 
it was basically like a, a annual conference where all the UX community was invited to. So the last time the team was able to get together was in 2019 pre-pandemic and over half the organization showed up in Mountain View for this event. It was so big that the fire marshal came twice to tell us that we had to, we had to lighten the That's load fantastic. on the building. And it was, that was back in yeah. the day. I can't back imagine that ever happening again, back right? Back in the day, like yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I think that at the time, over half the population was like over 1,700 people showed up. So it was it was a lot. That, that's a lot that's of people. That's fantastic. You know? That is a lot of people. Yeah. And it's all, you know, peer-to-peer education. So people would, we put out a call for proposals. People would propose, here's what I'd like to teach or talk about or, you know, have an expo on because there were many different components to it. Um, but it was all geared towards unlocking the knowledge that you know, was resident in in individuals or within teams or whatever for the greater good of the community. And, you know, so the knowledge was one aspect that was really important. But the other aspect that I think that was the unspoken piece was was the get to know you aspect and the social capital that would be um, built during that event that would carry over long after the event was over. So people would know who to go to because they've had exposure to them through their classes or their talks. They have or, a relationship yeah, with them. They, you know, the many social uh, engagements that they could have throughout the, the time of the conference, because we really kind of designed it so that there would be many opportunities for people to meet each other outside of just being in one of the classes. So, yeah, I think that that's a really big component is, is bringing people together, you know, and these days it would be virtually. And so I know that the team, I've left since, but the team is planning the next UXU this November and it's, it's all virtual. Meanwhile, I'm admiring that that image of you behind you. That's kind of amazing. <laughs> nice. Oh, the stuffed Andy? Yeah, is that stuffed? Yeah, I didn't know. It oh, that's is. amazing. <laughs> it's like uh, in, in the late 80s or early 90s, they had these wrestling buddies. Mm-hmm. So I used to wrestle professionally, but I wasn't good at wow. it, so I didn't do it very long. And someone recreated the uh, wrestling buddy as as me. So Fun that's, fact. that's yeah, exactly. No, you know the thing that's so interesting is is we're trying to build a community of practice right now in my organization. And when we think about design in our company, we've got a family of companies. So there are so many different companies that have small design teams, and our design team is well over a hundred. Um, we're on the path to to go over two hundred. So. We're, we're the largest design team outside of probably marketing. And what we're trying to do is bring everybody together and, and not worry so much about organizational mm-hmm. silos or where people report. And we're starting with, like you just described, that ability to like learn together and contribute back and solve problems together. So it, it's been going well. I, I think we do need somebody to actually formalize it because it is a lot of uh, everybody's role or a portion yeah. of everybody's role. Um, just curious, kind of like what what some of the things to look out for when when building a community. Uh, you know, we've talked about some of the good things that it solves, but what are some of the things that someone should be aware of as a potential like what if or expect this to happen and how we navigate that? Yeah, um, there were there were certain areas that we stayed away from, so, and that was just something that I I just felt like I knew from having done a more traditional, you know, UX leadership role in a product area, you know, and, and that would be, uh, try not to step on toes because that can just be really distracting when people feel like, wait, why, why are you trying to kind of, you know, enter this, this realm of things that, that I have quote unquote ownership over. So that was actually pretty easy because there's so much that you can do. You don't need to be entering areas that are already covered by another team. Um, just look for the areas that that basically have no owner, like I said, that actually have pain points. Um, and you'll find that, you know, people welcome you with open arms because people want people want the stuff to happen. They just need somebody to make it easy. So I think for you, because you don't have a dedicated, you know, team like UXCC was or whatever, um, I think that the the thing to watch out for is people volunteering to do something and then they get too busy to do it and then it ends up kind of falling flat. Um, so you, 
it's figuring out what the what this accountability model is. We ended up actually um, because we've recognized that like all this stuff is done through the dint of volunteers. Really, like we had a small team, and yes, we were we were dedicated to it, but the majority of the work was really volunteer fueled. Um, because of that, and because it, these aren't just like you know uh, frivolous types of activities, these are really really um, productive, right? Like the learning experiences and, and like I said, the, the social capital that gets built and carries over to like ongoing product collaboration is, is really key. We actually built in a citizenship component into our job ladders. And that was something that my team was empowered to do, you know, but it basically it said, look, we recognize that this, this stuff that you devote your time to is, is really important and you should, it should get acknowledged during your performance review time. You know, so um, that helped, you know, codifying something that that says, you know, this is thank you for contributing. That was worthwhile and you're going to get credit for it. Other ways of doing that, you might we, we had a system where we could give peer bonuses. It was a nominal amount, but it was really more the acknowledgement. And we also had, you know, kudos, which was non-monetary, just acknowledgement that was public you know, so figure out how you can actually acknowledge the work, because if you don't, people might just feel like I, I just put in so much time and it was fun. But like, I'm not going to do that again because I'm not going to credit. Be like, what do I get out of it? Right. So maybe think about that. You know, think about how do you give back? Right. No, that, that makes a ton of sense. We, we have a similar system internally where we give um, points that have a monetary yeah. value that people can then trade in for like gift certificates or cash in for like, I have enough points now to get a, a toaster sl- or <laughs> an air fryer slash toaster oven thing. So you must be excited. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I'll be able to condense two, um, you know, two different kitchen devices down to <laughs> one. So it, it'll be space saving. My wife will be happy. We have a lot of kitchen gadgets that never get used. Yeah, it's funny you say kitchen gadgets. I had to get rid of all of mine because I changed plugs. Mm. And I, you know what? You don't need all of them. That's all, that's my summary because this podcast <laughs> is not about kitchen gadgets. But And I love to cook. But honestly, a really some really good knives and a couple of essential kitchen gadgets and you're kind of set. But, um, and fire. Talk to me that's a couple, all you need. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Talk <laughs> to me a couple years from now because I, I I may have a kitchen full of gadgets again. It's very hard to watch by, walk by some of those beautiful things um, that they have. So I, you know, I wanted to shift gears a little bit on this and, you know, talk about a topic that, to be honest with you, Andy and I have shied away from addressing directly, which is equity and inclusion. Right. So, you know, I, I watched uh, just this morning uh, your your video, um, Insights from a Reluctant Leader. I think that's the name yeah. of it, um, if I'm remembering correctly. And it really, really resonated with me on a lot of a number of different fronts. And, you know, when Andy and I started the podcast, one of the strengths we thought was, OK, I'm a black woman in tech. Tech, he's a white guy in tech. We've got some bases covered and we have a diversity of experience. So on the equity inclusion and inclusion front, where do you think we are and how do you think we're going to get better? And when I say better, I even want to know what you think better is right on that, on that front. Um, I have opinions. I have opinions about it and it's, it's, just such a touchy topic to discuss um, because people, you feel like you have to take a side, right? Which already you're losing, right? You're you're already losing, but you feel like, you know, I'm a black woman. I feel like I ought to take the black woman's side. But, you know, once you're on a side, then you're not listening and you're not doing a lot of different things. It's just really, really challenging. So just, you know, uh, it's a very broad question, but where's your head on that right now? And, And you're talking about being a leadership coach is, you know, how are you going to factor all of that into that experience as well? That's a lot of questions. In that That's question. a lot of questions. <laughs> I, I always ask a lot of questions in a question. It's a bad, it's a bad habit of mine. I guess, I guess a short way to put it would be equity and inclusion. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, well, you know, I will say going back to, you mentioned the, the talk and it's also an article 
I feel like I, I kind of came in, came into my own late, you know, cause it was, that was like three years ago when, when the first time I gave that talk came out. And, um, it was really, it was really about just me saying it out loud, all these things that I think I was kind of feeling inside, but really didn't have a, a really formed formulated point of view that I could articulate. It was just a lived experience. And when I decided to say the stuff out loud, it was really incredibly personally empowering, but I could see that it also, um, had effects on other people who would come and talk to me about it, which was then even more empowering for me. Like it, it suddenly made me realize that I have a responsibility, you know, because if, if I can do this for anybody else, then I should do this, whatever that means, just talking about it, um, you know, shedding light on it, getting people, other people to talk about it. So, um, I found that that was just something, it was a very personal thing for me being, being able to, to basically articulate something that I think I had assumed was just, this was the way life is and it shouldn't be like this, right? Like as you know, I have kids that are becoming adults now. My, my first just went to college and my, my second will be following next year. You know, that definitely Congratulations. Made, thank you. Yeah. And that definitely made me think about like, you know, they're about to enter God knows what, you know, whatever they're about to enter, because I think they probably haven't faced a lot of the, the inequity that will, uh, they'll undoubtedly face at some point. Um, and I, you know, why not talk about it, right. To, to help the next generation or even the current generation, because we, you know, we talk about it, but we don't really talk about it. <laughs> That's what I feel like in companies. I feel like we, we make pledges. We, we have yeah. these objectives. We have these like volunteer employee resource groups that try to do things. But um, where is it getting us? You know, and I'm not saying that like as an individual, I'm going to get further than at a company level. But I felt like I had to do something that just felt like it had some meaning for myself, you know, so so that's what I chose to do is just to talk about my own experience. And um, as it has resonated with other people, it's it's at least within my conversations, I feel like at least that's helping a little bit. Um, but for me also, it's like, can I encourage other people to talk about their experiences? Because that's what it's going to take. I think otherwise it just stays in this abstract level of, yeah, you know, company yeah. commitments and whatnot or news coverage. Um, yeah. And then it goes away the next it goes away the next and day. Then, and, and it goes away. You know, I, I think that the other thing I I feel about it is that um, sometimes it's treated like a zero sum game, which I really resent. Right. So, you know, is is this population suffering more inequity than that population? Like it should be a yes and because we're UX people and we know how to say yes and, right? Like why are well, yeah, we? And, and yeah, yeah. It, Kimberly, is it Kimberly Crenshaw who talks about intersectionality? Yeah. I can't remember who, who, have I got that right? Okay. Um, to me, that's where the solution lies in right. understanding that, you know, every human being is a system and together we're all exactly. systems. And there's, you know, I am a black woman and there is an incredible amount of bias around me, but I'm solidly upper middle class and always have been. Right. There's just so there's, there's a lot of different, I picked up and moved to the Netherlands. What yeah. an incredibly privileged yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Right. Yet at the same time, I'm walking around, you know, in this body looking this way. And that causes people to treat me in a certain way right. or to have certain expectations around things. And so I think, you know, it's interesting that you bring that UX factor to it because it, it, it sounds like if people, and I think you mentioned this in your, in the article on the talk, if people can get over their fear of looking bad, yeah. Right. I mean, like when Saying Andy and I talk, or, yeah, when yeah. Andy and I talk about, about, about this, the, the number one thing I'm always bringing up is, oh my God, if we talk about equity and inclusion and then one of us says the wrong thing, we're really in trouble. Like, I, I think the last time we talked about it, I was like, we can protect each other. Like mm -hmm. I'm the black woman, you're the white guy, we can protect each other. Like there's <laughs> this, there's this defense 
of like, oh my God, I'm really scared that I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to say the wrong thing as a black woman, right? I'm going to say the wrong thing about somebody who's not like me or I'm going to whatever. And so I think if the UX community in particular, because at least on paper, (laughs) they're supposed to be researchers and people who are considering different viewpoints. If they can, as human beings, get over their own particular insecurities around looking not great, I'm just going to say stupid or not, or looking biased. I think that's what it is. Nobody, people are afraid to think and say things, right? And so that's why I really appreciate your um, coming out and telling your story and it's so it's so simple. I'm, I I know just from my own reluctance sometimes to talk about things that have happened to me that it looks simple, but it's not. It takes an incredible amount of emotional courage. So I really appreciate Thank you. you know you taking the steps to do that because it's you know from at a practical level you're like you're worried vocationally. Oh, am I going to say something that's somehow going to make me seem like a less strong? viable professional or I'm going to, or yeah. whatever. So, so that's, that's really, really helpful. So are you, when you think about leadership coaching, are you thinking about including aspects of that in it? What, what do you, what direction is that going to be? Um, maybe has actually nothing to do with that, or is it going to be more individual leadership coaching? Why are you uh, moving in that what direction? Well, you, you I may must. have, I may have swiped your question, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. I'll just answer Andy then. Yeah, answer, um, answer Andy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, you mentioned something that really resonates. You said, you know, we're a system and it's so true. That's actually how I am thinking about this transition into leadership coaching is actually quite natural going from working on, you know, community and culture at scale at Google, which definitely was a system, right. Um, to actually one-on-one leadership coaching, which is basically looking at the individual leader within the system, because that's a really important role that, leaders play is, is how do they navigate the system as themselves, you know, as their authentic selves, whatever that means. Um, and, you know, I, I think that that's, that's where the, the DEI element could come in, but it's not something that I'm necessarily, you know, leading with, but I do think sure. that whoever it is that's coming to me, I think that's going, going to be a consideration. You know, if there's somebody that feels like they're underrepresented, in their group where they, they, yeah, they don't, they feel like they're the only one. I think that's a really important factor for existing in a system that we would want to address. So. That's cool. That's cool. So you're just going to keep being you. (laughs) Which, which is, you know, the, the most authentic thing to do, but I'm curious, you know, when did you first realize that leadership coaching is what you wanted to do? Was there a specific moment that, basically led you to like, all right, I'm at Google for 14 and a half years and now is the time I'm going to go do this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a complicated question. I think, I think I'd always, not always, but you know, for the past couple of years, I've been thinking about leadership coaching as a potential, you know, next step, because I think I, I tended to give a lot of, you know, advice, which that's not, is not the same as coaching, but adjacent to it, maybe. Um, and I, I just realized that that was something I enjoyed doing. And like I said, the whole, I do like working at systems levels and, and thinking about a leader as part of the system was intriguing to me because leaders are so um, such an important part of the system. They influence so much of the system that if you can get that right, it, it can have such a multiplier effect. So that, that was intriguing to me. But also I think that the real turning point was I had a really great coach the last year or so that I was at Google that really kind of made me think about what do I really want to do um, and co- just cl- help me clarify this as a next step. So, and of course the pandemic, right? The pandemic got everybody <laughs> thinking you know, a little bit more introspective, you know, so. How are you no, holding no, up the- with that? How are you? How have you been during the pandemic? All right. Yeah, I think I've been okay. I mean, you know, it's, I've. I, I think that some of the one of the advantages was actually that ability to get introspective and to make a decision. You know, so yeah, that's definitely a privilege that yeah. that some of us had during this yeah. time. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't wish it on like any other teenager. So I've watched my teenage kids navigate high school through this pandemic. It's horrible. Yeah, I can ima- I can yeah. imagine. I have a I have a grown son and I I 
was really glad that he's an adult yeah. already because I thought, I mean, it was challenging for him in a number of different ways. He works in the entertainment industry and that was just basically shut down, but it it, it is uh, definitely hard. It's hard. Yeah. Still is hard <laughs> for some people. And now we're seeing, especially like they're, they're, you know, typically people tend to move on in their careers and the pandemic, I think, has done a, a decent job of keeping people where they are because of the safety net of like, I don't need to leave my company. But as we're starting to get out of it and hearing things like the great resignation, we are starting to see people just explore what's out there. And it's it's a candidate market for sure right now, which is which is really interesting. Um, curious kind of as as you talk about coaching and, and, and not looking for any free coaching sessions <laughs> in the moment. Uh, just, just your opportunity to practice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, uh, you know, curious kind of, of what you're seeing as, as you, you know, go into this new role in terms of some of the key areas that people are struggling with, that leaders are struggling with right now. Um, well, I'm, I think a lot of people tend to come to coaching when they're at a transition point of some sort, um, generally. Um, maybe they're trying to make a change in their leadership style or they got a new role and they need to kind of, you know, level up. Um, or they just recognize something, they're self-aware of some habit that they want to change. Uh, but I think that one of the, you know, I, I think that the common theme there is what behaviors aren't suiting you well anymore that you want to acknowledge and, and maybe change, you know? So that to me is probably at the crux of a lot of the coaching that, that so far that, that I've been doing is just what's holding you back from the thing that you want to do. And can we address that? Cause sometimes it's not obvious, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, somebody might know what they want to do, but they just don't know why they're not able to get there. And that's kind of the, the nugget for coaching. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. And, and it's funny because like you talked about earlier, kind of giving advice and coaching are, are so different. I think there's an aspect of, of coaching when you're actually leaning in and helping someone that you're also learning a lot from that process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the, the greatest things I've learned are in my efforts to kind of, uh, coach or or mentor others, so it's it's very admirable. I uh, it, it's one of those things that we we starting to we're starting to play with some leadership coaching in our organization. At least it's become available to me in, in some of these sessions, and I see the benefits. So it's uh, it's really important. But anyway, Margaret, I, I want to be respectful of our time. You know, how can people get in touch with you, stay up to date on, on your leadership coaching, what you have yeah. going on? Like, what's the best way for them to do so? Um, I'm not a super active uh, tweeter, but I, I do peruse Twitter on a daily basis. So you can always reach me on Twitter at Frau House Lee. That's F-R-A-U-H-A-U-S-L-E-E. -E. Um I'm also on LinkedIn. So those are those are probably the, the easiest ways to get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk about all of the things. Uh, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks. Yeah, it was really I great to meet it. you. I wish you I wish you really I wish you well in Thank all you. you're doing. You too. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy surfacing, please rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Also, consider supporting the podcast on Patreon at patreon.com slash surfacingpodcast. If you have suggestions for guests or a topic you'd like to hear about on surfacing, please reach out via the contact form found at surfacingpodcast.com.